of uh, role of trans role of transplant in management of hepatocellular carcinomas so like the usual format we will have a lecture followed by a panel discussion so i invite dr sonal asthana who is a transplant surgeon basically in the astro hospital so sir will be delivering a lecture basically on role of transplant in hepatocellular carcinomas basically overview and indications and a brief discussion on how to proceed so sir i welcome you for the lecture please take over uh thank you so much uh thank you dr shalin dr nikhil dr shafali for this very kind introduction it's a pleasure uh, to be giving this talk uh, at this uh, educational symposium uh my job is made easier because i know it's followed by a case discussion which will probably highlight some of the factors which i may not have time to go in detail in this presentation so the plan today essentially is to talk a little bit about liver transplantation in the context of um, hepatocellular carcinoma who can benefit who does not benefit and uh, how does one select these patients is my screen visible yes yes sir. your screen is visible yes. yeah okay perfect so um, hepatocellular carcinoma is a cause of concern for all of us uh, it has a rising incidence it's the fifth commonest cause of death in men in india uh, broadly speaking its incidence parallels the incidence of hepatitis b and uh predictably it's higher in the southeast asian region of the world as well as in india uh, more importantly in india we see a lot of hcc linked to nash which is a growing concern this can also happen in non cirrhotic patients now why should we care because while we seem to be winning in most other indications of cancer we have actually shown a demonstrable uh, decrease in mortality over several years uh, the, this is certainly not the case in a few number of cases uh, of this thing for example lung cancer esophageal or pancreatic cancer melanomas and liver and bile duct cancers where the mortality has in fact really? increased over time as compared uh, to the other cancers uh what is the cause of hepatocellular carcinoma in india again broadly speaking in india the cause is linked to viral disease for the large part but of course nash and alcoholic liver disease are becoming more prominent uh when we once we jump to the management because i understand that radiology has been covered already uh one must realize that it is in fact not one but two diseases that you are dealing with as opposed to say oncology where you are dealing with just one tumor occurring in a particular organ here you are not only treating the tumor but you are also treating liver disease because the vast majority of patients occur in a damaged liver now this damaged liver can have two components it can have hepatocellular components where it can have uh, jaundice ascites gi bleeds and so on and so forth or it can have a portal hypertensive component uh, which both each of which has a negative prognostic implication on the treatment of liver abilities that we can do when we talk about treatment we have to think about surgical resection which is curative or transplantation non surgical ablation embolization systemic therapy etc and of course all these treatments although uh, they may be present they have to be seen in the context of what is deliverable locally so broadly speaking when we look at uh, uh, staging systems this is probably a slide that you've seen before for hcc management where we have the barcelona clinic system where essentially it combines not just the liver disease or the liver tumor but also the functional status of the patient and based on that certain recommendations are made for uh, uh, treatment whether curative or palliative i mean it's a simpler way of looking at it in a different way you can have a good tumor occurring in a good liver you can have a good tumor in a bad liver or cirrhotic liver a bad tumor which would mean you know an aggressive tumor a vascular invasion in a good liver or a bad tumor occurring in a bad liver which is a, uh, an advanced tumor in a cirrhotic liver and depressingly most of our patients come in the bad tumor bad liver categories almost 50% of patients present in this category the good tumor good liver category which is bclc a these are patients who could potentially undergo a resection is a very small proportion of the people who we normally see in clinic so what are the arguments for liver resection uh, because it's important to see both these things in context as dr shivali said it's when a patient comes to you in clinic often the decision is 
what is the best or the most optimal treatment to have for those patients. And, and predictably, like uh, in a Facebook relationship, it is actually complicated. It's not a very straightforward answer. So when you have a patient like this, who's got a, serot, uh, a large tumor, non-serotic liver, you can see that it's a tumor which is well confined with a normal looking liver, then the treatment is very simple. You do a hepatectomy and you can expect a long-term sort of uh, good results with this depending on the tumor biology. A patient like this who has got a large tumor in a serotic liver has a lot more complications because you have to look at not just the tumor recurrence or the resection, but also the functional status of the liver. Uh, the pros and cons, of course, are as follows. Uh, a liver transplant is probably a complete treatment because you not only treat the tumor, but you also treat uh, the serotic liver. You have removed the entire field of cancerization through a total hepatectomy. Uh, it does carry a donor risk, and it can only be offered in limited uh, hospitals across the country or in the world, actually. As opposed to a liver resection, which is an individual patient's resection, it is not dependent on organ availability and it is available in probably a few more places as compared to transplantation. And there are of course newer modalities such as laparoscopic carotid resection, which might uh, improve the safety profile of this. So when we plan treatment for a, uh, a patient with NCC, we of course have to look at organ availability, which, is, which differs widely across the world, uh, DDLT being prevalent in the West, as opposed to LDLT in the East. The, uh, the quality of the liver in terms of the degree of serotic liver function, and of course the potential for long-term recurrence, which is based on the tumor biology as well as the baseline cause of liver failure, such as hepatitis B and C, uh, which will always carry a higher risk of tumor recurrence. And when we look at resectability, we have to see whether it's technically feasible to resect that part of the liver, whether it's oncologically appropriate, uh, because there's no sense in resecting something with positive margins or resecting a tumor that has already undergone distance spread. And of course, the host condition and fitness for surgery. Technical resectability has multiple factors. I will not go into them in this detail, but suffice it to say that we have to look at liver function, both static and dynamic. We also have to look at the degree of portal hypertension, which will in fact inter uh, determine whether or not we can go ahead with the major liver resection or not. Uh, depressingly, a very small proportion of people who present to us even with child's A cirrhosis are actually candidates for a major liver resection because of the risk of uh, liver failure that happens. Uh, when we start from the reverse, when should one not offer a liver transplant? Firstly is failure to, uh, to achieve the listing criteria. Patients who are present with locally advanced or disseminated tumor uh, are probably not good candidates to have this. Patients who have tumor progression with vascular invasion or extra hepatic spread, tumor size and number that remains beyond your inclusion criteria despite downstaging, or tumor progression that requires delisting and recurrence of HC after liver transplantation. These are patients perhaps who would not benefit from liver transplantation primarily. Uh, this of course is not counting patient specific factors such as performance status, uh, which, which will determine the suitability for both the resection as well as transplantation. Broadly speaking, these are the two criteria that are followed worldwide you know, with sort of uh, honorable exceptions in several situations. The first is the Milan criteria, which was set forward in a landmark paper in the NEJM by Massever et al., uh, yeah, which basically said that tumors of less than five centimeters or two to three tumors, which are less than three centimeters without any disease outside the liver, could have survivals that were comparable to other non-tumorous causes of liver transplantation. This criteria was expanded by Yao et al. in 2001, which increased the size criteria, increased the number of tumors, and basically also made allowance, make sure that there was no extra hepatic spread. And the results for these very well-studied criteria are uh, essentially 75% survival at Milan at three years, at five years, and 87.5% for UCSF at three years. So these are very well-studied and well-categorized uh, criteria. But of course, this has become complicated. It's not as simple as this. So as a pop quiz, I mean, just uh, for the audience, uh, how many management guidelines do you think exist for hepatitis carcinoma? And for anybody who has actually guessed more than 10, uh, they probably should get any points here because when I last checked, this was about two, three years ago, there are almost 22 different kinds of management guidelines. So clearly when there are so many management guidelines, it does mean that the question 
that they're trying to answer is unresolved. So predominantly, one thing to understand is that biology is king. We are measuring all the other factors as a surrogate of biology, whether it is tumor size, the alpha beta protein level, or the degree of extrapatic spread or invasion. The preoperative biological factors, uh, AFP is very, very widely used at different levels. Uh, there is a survival decline at levels of more than 20, uh, but the cutoff levels range from 200 to 400 to 1000 based on the different criteria that are used. Uh, PIFCA is used as well. PET positivity is perhaps something that uh, we in the living, living donor transplant world use quite a lot because a PET positive tumor is much, much more likely to recur. Uh, NLR is uh, the one of the, the pivoting things that decides the risk of recurrence in the moral score, which is another new score that has come out. Uh, the newer things that are coming out of microanalysis, which are looking at differentially regulated genes in recurrent HCC. Uh, these basically we have seen that uh, there are uh, differences in the FXR activation in checkpoint regulators as well as in hepatic cholestasis. Now, biomarkers is an area where actually there is a lot of good work coming out of uh, India at this time. Liquid biopsy is looking at circulating tumor cells. The positive predictor value for CTC detection uh, is almost 89%. Circulating cell-free DNA, uh, this is currently being uh, studied in uh, the Rela Institute uh, in Chennai, as well as uh, the work that has come out of Max Hospital itself that looked at encapsulated microRNA as a circulating diagnostic marker, and particularly in patients with low AFP. Uh, so these are patients who had other markers of bad biology as, uh, as compared to alpha feed of protein which is only elevated in about 60% of all our patients. So broadly speaking, all the criteria that we are looking at can be put in this chart, which is called the metro ticket chart. Essentially, the further away you go in terms of nodules and size, the worse your outcomes are going to be. So broadly speaking, uh, you know, one can decide uh, the risk and benefit of a transplant based on the expected five-year survival uh, number of nodules and uh, tumor size in different criteria, uh, depending on one, what criteria one chooses in one's own center. So if to summarize this, the summary slide is basically in service of LCC, patients who are decompensated need a transplant. Patients who are well compensated without portal hypertension can have a resection. Patients who are within the criteria that is Milan or UCSF, can undergo a transplant directly. Patients who are outside these criteria should undergo downstaging before they actually are offered transplantation. This is probably uh, the cliff notes of the entire presentation, you know, in terms of a summary slide. Uh, what are the current consensus among uh, different societies? Essentially, selection criteria, as discussed, should include tumor biology, tumor size and number, probability of survival, and transplant benefit. A risk benefit will come up at different points, and we'll just talk about this a little bit more. Liver transplant is the first line option of HCCs and serotics within the Milan criteria. Uh, although this recommendation will have to be taken with a pinch of salt because depending on where you are, what facilities are available to you, and whether transplantation is a feasible option or not. Now, we of course live in two different worlds when transplant is considered. One is the East, where LDLT is the commonest form of transplant, living donor is the commonest form of transplant. And in the West, where deceased donor liver transplant is a common thing. The only thing that is uh, that these two modalities have in common is the word transplantation, because the logistics and the prioritization is completely different for, say, a patient who has a living donor versus someone who has to wait on a deceased on the waiting list. So for a living donor, considering the options are, you have to be able to justify the risk that a donor is goes through in order to, uh, to accept a minimal acceptable recipient survival. So broadly speaking, we think that a minimum acceptable overall survival should be the same as one would expect in a patient with a non-tumor indication. So about 60% at five years LDNT. Now there is a lot of difference between disease-free survival and overall survival. I think that that is probably a spurious discussion because we should consider overall survival rather than disease -free survival. Because the treatment options for us, even in HCC recurrence, increase exponentially when we are dealing with the normal liver. We also should make sure that the donor risk is limited to less than 5% for major complications. Now, in DDLT, we must remember that 
apart from the patient criteria, we have to look at the equity of allocating an organ to the patient who would otherwise go to somebody else. So that's why we need to make sure that the survival benefit that we are getting out of the organ is comparable in patients with tumors as compared to outside tumors. So the acceptable survival is defined as 50 to 70% of five years. Now, within our survival criteria, if you have single small tumors, they may do as well with a resection or as with a transplant within reason, depending on the location, size, and the efficiency or the availability of portal hypertension. Patients who have fitting in within Milan criteria are awarded MIL priority scores, and these priority scores are revised every three months based on restaging the CT scan and AFP. Of course, this is something that is very, very contentious. Uh, currently, there is a lot of argument about these, whether these priority scores are, are uh, in fact, justified or not. And uh, certainly, equity is something that we will continue to argue on. Certainly, in our state in Karnataka, uh, DDLT patients have to fulfill uh, criteria within Milan criteria. And for LDLT, we take patients up to UCSF criteria. Now, when patients are waiting on a waiting list or are not able to undergo transplant, immediately, will bridging therapy like TAS or TAR help? Now, this was a meta-analysis uh, that came out in 2018, which basically showed a non-significant trend towards improved wait list and post-transplant outcomes when bridging therapy was used in patients who were waiting. In our practice, if patients are likely to wait more than three months, then we would offer them bridging ther therapy uh, if uh, patients were even within the line criteria. Uh, perhaps the only exception would be a single tumor that was less than three centimeters in size. Uh, the, again, the importance, the pros and cons of a waiting list. You must remember that a lot of patients who are waiting on the waiting list do drop out. So when we look at intention to treat treatment, uh, even a high-risk liver resection in certain patient groups might have a similar survival when we look at uh, patients who are, in fact, waiting for a long time uh, for a transplant. So patients who are listed have a 24% risk of dropping out uh, from a transplant waiting list. But perhaps this is uh, the most important slide because liver transplant does convey, uh, convey or give a long-term survival benefit. So when we look at one-year overall survivals, uh, they may be comparable for liver resection, liver transplant in comparable patients, but certainly uh, the disease-free survivals are substantially better in the liver transplant group and the overall survival benefit starting from five years post-transplant is substantially better in these patients. So if you have a younger patient who's cirrhotic, then perhaps a liver transplant is uh, the right treatment to offer them. So again, uh, to summarize the entire discussion, liver transplantation is the best treatment modality for cirrhotic patients with HCC. I should probably put an asterisk there because this is something that has to be debated and has to be guided by patient criteria, availability of donors, local expertise and outcomes. Liver transplant within Milan criteria has the best results. As we exceed Milan criteria, our results substantially decrease and risk benefits are defined based on region, based on uh, allocation criteria. Uh, in our setup, living donor transplant offers better locked up survival and the option of a timely transplant. Uh, certainly, this has to be balanced against the donor risk that we put a patient through, as well as the expected long term survival. Patients who are waiting for a transplant should be offered bridging therapy, and certainly after patients who are being downstaged, uh, being, uh, being brought back from advanced stage into Milan criteria should be followed up for at least three months before a transplant option is offered because in order to study the tumor biology uh, uh, in case to see which patients drop out because of tumor recurrence. And as always, we are slaves of biology. Biology is king. Uh, that is what defines you know, the long-term outcomes for uh, recurrence disease-free as well as overall survival for HCC. Thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, thank you so much, sir. Uh, there are uh, two or three questions. So as uh, you have rightly mentioned that biology is the king. So does biology um, is governed by the time, waiting time for the transplant? Or do we have certain other characteristics like AFP level or other criteria which guide you? Okay, this is the cutoff and beyond that you should not select the patient. Correct. So, uh, yeah. so uh, what I'll, uh, as I've just given you, uh, a very, very broad guideline. I'll tell you what specifically is done in our center and broadly in centers across India. So when a patient comes to us, we would be 
judging the size and number of tumors as well as major vascular invasion and extra hepatic disease. The presence of major yeah. vascular invasion, extra hepatic disease would be an indicator that the biology is aggressive. Similarly, what we use typically is alpha fetoprotein. Alpha fetoprotein is an imperfect uh, marker in the Indian context because almost 40% of people that we come across are non-secretors. So broadly speaking, alpha fetoprotein, the level has got a direct correlation with biology. Any level that is more than 20 has a worse prognostic outcome. The cutoff that we use in our setup is more than 400 nanograms for deciding whether or whether or not somebody is suitable for transplant in the first instance. So uh, there are other centers that use a cutoff cut of 1,000, but as I've discussed in the metro ticket, it is basically the risk and the five-year survival that one is willing to accept in one's own setting. So we use AFP. In our setup, we tend to use PET scan for these patients. We use AFP and we have started using PIVCA substantially more because a lot of our patients do turn out to be AFP negative but PIVCA positive. So uh, uh, there are a large number of uh, biological tests available. They are likely to get better as you know CFDNA or exosome-based mRNA is more commonly indicated in practice. So we are uh, yes. uh, we use biology in a very broad sense, but at this time it is still a very blunt instrument. So the, the difference here is downstaging and new adjuvant therapy. Now, downstaging as by definition means downstaging to a particular level. So, downstaging has a specific outcome. For example, if your outcome is getting a patient within Milan criteria. So, if a patient comes to you who is outside Milan criteria, say a patient who's uh, got a tumor of say 7 centimeters, 7.5 centimeters, then the objective of downstaging is getting them back to within Milan criteria. So, that is the difference Perhaps the, the subtle difference between neoadjuvant therapy and downstaging in the context of liver transplantation for HCC. Okay. Now, whether one is able to downstage into that criteria or not, should help one decide on two things, whether one is a candidate for transplant or not. Secondly, whether it is an indicator of aggressive biology. So that time period of three months, which I mentioned later, is quite an important thing because once you treat you have an option for the biology to declare itself. In that time, if you see multiple nodules developing or extra hepatic disease developing, then you know that perhaps a liver transplant option would be a futile option in that situation. So uh, I think uh, Dr. Sharma has asked another question. That is the role for resection in reducing the dropout rate. So in certain cases, yes. You know, resection, uh, perhaps, I mean, this is the... Uh, slide uh, that answers your question, Dr. Aribam. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. What is the perfect treatment? Liver transplantation. But can you wait for a liver transplant forever? You probably cannot. If you have a setup where you're offering resection for tumors that are maybe child, say, single tumors, easily resectable with, in a patient without portal hypertension, you must go ahead and do that. Okay. So right, I, think sir. I think it's important to uh, individualized treatment based on what is available and the expertise available here. Right. Very well said, sir. So what kind of bridging therapy uh, in your experience you rely on or evidence base, uh, which can do the job for it? Okay. So tumors that are within Milan, multiple tumors within Milan are typically treated with taste therapy in our setup. If it is a single tumor uh, within Milan, less than four centimeters, then we would consider RFA. RFA, because uh, in our experience, RFA actually has better tumor kill and better support uh, as compared to taste in the long term, because the reality is that waiting lists are unpredictable for DDLT in our country. Uh, the, uh, in a very, very select group of patients who have had uh, segmental portobin thrombosis, we have experienced, we have tried to give tear therapy as a downstaging modality. We have not transplanted anybody who we have given tear so far. But uh, these are the three modalities which we are more likely to use. Uh, uh, I mean, I must say that, uh, qualify that. Nowadays, we are using microwave more often than we are using a radio frequency ablation. Right, sir. And any kind of uh, uh, a scenario case or any kind of situation where you, you would prefer to go for adjuvant also, systemic therapy post-transplant. So is there any criteria where you keep in mind, okay, I know that is not a perfect situation, but is there any case scenario where you would like to prefer continuation of adjuvant treatment? 
So, I mean, essentially, the long, the larger studies uh, that have happened uh, for adjuvant therapy in a post transplant setting have not shown a survival benefit. Uh, there's been some modest survival benefit, non significant survival benefit in a recent study that has come out of India, which was published earlier this year. Um, at this time, we are not offering any adjuvant therapy for patients post transplantation. Uh, I think there's probably a little bit more evidence in terms of the immunosuppression that we use. Uh, I have not discussed that because this is a GI oncology group, but certainly the mTOR inhibitors, uh, early adoption of mTOR inhibition has got some uh, survival benefit in, uh, in certain trials uh, uh, that, 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 uh, uh, that we use. So basically, we would use uh, early induction of Everolimus rather than Serolimus now um, and uh, sort of rely on the survival benefit that it gives. Right, sir. So thank you so much, sir. So now we move on to the panel discussion and I would request you to be there uh, in the panel also. And um, I, sir, uh, please, if you can stop sharing so that I think Dr. Shalin can take over. So I welcome Dr. Shalin. Um, he's a transplant surgeon again in Max Hospital, Sakate. And uh, he would be moderating the panel discussion on role of uh, liver transplant in hepatocellular carcinomas. And uh, sir, I welcome you to take over uh, the stage. And uh, his panelists would be uh, Dr. Asthana, Dr. Ilan Kumaran, who is again a GI uh, surgeon in uh, uh, Kuveri Hospital, Chennai. Dr. Madhumita, who is a hepatologist in PGI Chandigarh. Dr. V. Arun Kumar, who is again a hepatologist in Apollo Hospital, New Delhi. And Dr. Suhail Qureshi, who is a medical oncologist in Fortis Hospital, Shalmar Bagh. So sir, please take over and uh, continue. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shefali. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Nikhil and Dr. Shefali for uh, inviting me on this forum. And I think uh, this is a very pertinent topic when we are discussing HCCs because transplantation has become a very important part of the armamentarium or the treatment modalities that are available. And Dr. S uh, Sonal has nicely covered in a very short time the entire gamut of transplant options, the pros and cons. So my job today, what I was told was, to how to apply this knowledge, which Dr. Asthana has talked about in the real life setting, in the daily uh, ROPDs and IN patients, how we do apply this knowledge to the actual patient management. And that's why I have chosen three cases to discuss amongst our esteemed panelists. So I would share my screen. Is my screen visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So the role of transplantation in management of HCC. So welcome all the panelists. I welcome you all. So I'll just uh, uh, in three, four slides, I'll give a summary of what Dr. Asthana has said and Dr. Sonal has given an uh, overview, but it's just three, four slides which are very practically uh, applicable. So few points, especially for the students and the young surgeons and physicians who are uh, attending this uh, discussion. So things is that HCC is not an uncommon uh, malignancy. Unfortunately, it carries a high mortality because we don't have many adjuvant treatment modalities available as of date, although newer molecules are being introduced, but unfortunately not many of them have shown dramatic change in outcomes. Although a lot of claims have been made in the studies, but we have all realized in our practice that not many adjuvant options are available to these patients. And another part which Dr. Asthana has also emphasized, and I think it, uh, it can be re-emphasized that most of these tumors arise on the background of liver cirrhosis. So as he said, again, I will reiterate that we are dealing with two conditions. That is the underlying cirrhosis as well as the HCC. So uh, that's why the treatment planning would also depend on the stage of the disease, that is the spread of the tumor and what criteria it fits in. And at the same time, we have to see the condition of the underlying liver. For that, we use the CTP scoring or the MELD scoring systems uh, for seeing what is the stage of decompensation of the liver disease, underlying uh, cirrhosis. So the treatment modalities have been summarized in this slide quickly. So surgery is, is the mainstay of treatment. It is the major modality of curative treatment for HCCs and surgery includes both resection and transplantation. Ablative therapies, RFA, microwave, cryoablation. RFA and microwave are the ones which are being used more, most often. Again, they form 
a part of the definitive treatment armamentarium as well as part of the downstaging protocols. Embolization, again, a very important therapy, but mainly for palliation and downstaging. It could be a, a chemo embolization or a radio embolization. Each one has their own pros and cons. Radiotherapy, especially the targeted radiotherapy for tumor thrombi, and uh, it, again, it's palliative or for downstaging. And then chemotherapy or includes the kinase inhibitors such as sorafenib, lenvatinib, PD-1 inhibitors, and mainly they have a palliative role. Again, as uh, Dr. Shefali had asked and uh, Dr. Asthana rightly said that they don't really have a role in adjuvant settings. Studies have till date not shown any major advantage of adding uh, them in the post-transplant or post-resection leading to any survival advantage. So we, as in our practice, do not routinely prescribe these medications in the adjuvant setting. They are reserved mainly for palliation, but uh, Dr. Sohail may be able to throw, may shed more light on this. So coming to liver transplantation per se, I would like to emphasize only three points. One, it has a dual role. It is the most comprehensive management of liver cancer. Unlike other cancers in other parts of the body, it not only treats the cancer, but also the underlying disease, which primarily has led to the evolution of that cancer because healthy livers rarely have tumors in them. They do have, but uh, very uncommon. Liver transplantation offers the best hope of long-term survival, but the caveat remains that they have to be within criteria, either the Milan criteria or the UCS criteria. And I think most centers, at least in India, follow the UCSF criteria, which is just a slight expansion of the Milan criteria where the tumor diameters, it's basically based on the number and the size of the tumor. So it's the UCSF is a slight expansion of uh, Milan, just in order to include more patients into the ambit of liver transplant so that more patients can benefit. And it's been repeatedly shown, starting right from Professor Yao's paper, in late 90s that uh, despite the modest increase, the outcomes are almost as good as Milan. And uh, for patients who present with tumors outside the criteria, there is still hope because it has been now clearly shown that patients which can be downstaged within Milan do have a reasonably good survival. So before I start the case presentation per se, I would, uh, this slide is just to uh, uh, show which where in which cases there is no controversy. So who would be an ideal candidate for liver transplant? It would be a middle aged. Why middle aged? Because you can offer them very good survival vis-a-vis -a, -vis a patient of 75 years or 70 years whom you are choosing for transplant. Ambulatory, that is good performance status. That I tell my patients for, who come for liver transplant that the patients who come walking, go home walking. So a good performance status is very essential because liver transplant per se is a major insult to the body in the initial uh, first two weeks and the patient's reserve should be enough to withstand those two weeks. Should have decompensated cirrhosis, although child say are good enough, but in our experience, we have seen that patients who present with decompensated cirrhosis, they get this actual dual benefit. That is, you are treating this liver disease, which has already decompensated and at the same time, you are treating their tumors. HCC within criteria, that is the UCS criteria that we all in India follow. AFP values of less than 100 and as was said by Dr. Sonam, that different centers have different cutoffs. But yes, the, there was a study from United States multi-center study which said that less than 100, uh, 10, if you have AFP less than 100, then the survival outcomes are better. But different cutoffs have been uh, shown, 400 and up to 1,000. But again, the higher the FP values, FP actually is a very, very important prognostic marker. And as uh, it's a very important indicator surrogate for the biology of the tumor. So higher the FP, the higher the chances of recurrence in the long term. Whatever value you choose as a cutoff, but the basic fact remains the higher the value, the higher the chance of recurrence. FDG non-evident PET CT with non, uh, no evidence of extrahepatic disease. These tumors are considered to be metabolically less active and therefore less aggressive. So a middle-aged ambulatory patient with decomposed cirrhosis with HCC within UCSF criteria, low FP values, and a PET non avid tumor. This would be an ideal candidate for liver transplant. So I'm not putting up any case. Almost 40-50% cases fall into this criteria that present to our OPDs. And there is no controversy about these patients. You cannot offer any other modality. You cannot resect them and offering them RFA, ablation, or taste, 
is not going to help them. You are doing a disservice by not offering transplant to these patients. So there's no controversy. Now coming to a more practical scenario, and we are like, as I said, 50 to 60% of patients will present where there are some dilemmas. And therefore I have chosen three representative cases where we can discuss about these dilemmas. So the case one I would start is a 47 years male, a known case of chronic hepatitis B for the last six years. There are no known comorbidities. Patient is asymptomatic with a very good performance status. He has, he's been on antiviral medication and currently he has undetectable viral load. So this question I would put to Dr. Madhumita, who's a hepatologist and would be dealing with such cases. How would you follow up a patient with chronic hepatitis B? So in, uh, this is a bit of a loaded question, sir, because uh, this patient is 47 year old and was detected with chronic hepatitis B for six years. Yes. But we know that in India, people are living with hepatitis B because it's essentially horizontal transmission. So it's just possible that he was detected at the first screening six years ago, maybe at the age of 40, but might have been living with HBV for a long time. And now we know that unlike hep C, where you know, the risk of HCC is related to the underlying fibrosis. But in HPV, unfortunately, the risk of HC uh, of developing carcinoma is related to the total duration, the level of HBV DNA, the degree of integration of the genome of HPV into the human uh, DNA, as well as C, a covalently closed uh, triple C DNA. So all of these and also, you know, comorbidities, as you have mentioned, is not there, but one has to specifically ask for alcohol intake. So the more the number of issues that are there, the more the risk of HCC. So we are knowing that this patient has good performance status and is asymptomatic and is currently being treated. So I would like to know uh, what is his uh, liver stiffness measurement and in, in case, what is his ALT? Is there any evidence of necroinflammation? If the patient is cirrhotic, then he will require six monthly screening for uh, HCC. And in some patients where we are having some kind of dysplastic nodules or there is strong family history of HCC, one would screen more often. So the follow-up actually depends on the level of uh, fibrosis, how long the patient has been living with hepatitis B. And it is not just a question of uh, since detection. We have to actually check how long the patient has had it. Okay, I think uh, you have very rightly put it, uh, that it would all depend on, because he must have picked it up earlier, it was only these, most of these patients are incidentally detected. So, just a second. So, yes, so, uh, as you rightly said, that... Uh, we would, it would all depend how long the patient has been with hepatitis B, but as to our knowledge, he was detected six years back. So what investigations that we recommended and uh, our hepatologist would do is the routine blood investigations, a, a fibro scan and serum AFP every six months. And fibro scan is done only at the baseline. If the patient is found to be cirrhotic, we don't repeat the fibro scans. But yes, we do a closer follow-up because once the cirrhosis develops, the likelihood of developing cancers and uh, increases. Although, as you rightly said, that uh, in hepatitis B, de novo cancers, even without fibrosis, are well known. So the blood investigations that we recommend are the routine CBC, LFT, KFT, INR, and serum AFP every four months. The hemoglobin was 10 gram, platelets were above 1 lakh, bilirubin 1.6, creatinine renal functions were all normal. Albumin was also well preserved 3.2 and AFP value was 87. Ultrasound abdomen gave indication that the, he had already become cirrhotic. So because it showed an irregular outline of the liver and at the same time, incidentally, it was found that he has a solitary four centimeter SOL in the right lobe of the liver. There was no associated ascites or evidence of portal vein throm thrombosis. So what would be the next investigation? Dr. Ilan Kumaran, if you are there, please answer this question. Dr. Ilan, are you there? So if uh, Dr. Ilan- I can't see her, uh, I can't see his name, sir. Probably he- so I'll pass on this question to Dr. Arun. Dr. Arun? Hello, sir. Hi, sir. So please, uh, what would be the next investigation that you'd like to offer this to? Uh, 
uh, sir, I would like to go ahead with the uh, 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 city, most likely pet city, uh, which includes. Oh, so what we usually do is that instead of straight away going for a pet CT, we prefer to do an MRI these days. Although there is, uh, as per the studies, there is no data that to choose one over the other. But what we have seen is that MRI, contrast MRI especially, gives more information in terms of the morphology of nodules in cirrhotic background. Because as we all are aware that cirrhotic livers more often tend to have these multiple regenerating nodules. And a CT sometimes doesn't give you a clear cut information. Uh, because the classical arterial phase enhancement and the washout may not be seen in the smaller tumor, in smaller nodules that is around two centimeters. So, as a first investigation, we like to do uh, a triple phase MRI. But any of these two modalities can be used depending on uh, the center's preference. And as I just said, that MRI scores over CT is picking up smaller tumors. That's why we these days have shifted from CT to doing routine MRIs in these patients just to confirm the ultrasound findings. But uh, continuing with you, Dr. Arun, what is the role of PET-CT? Now you tell about in uh, HCC, uh, what is the exact role of pet uh, The most important role of PET-CT is to identify uh, extra hepatic metastasis uh, uh, to see whether there are any uptake within the primary tumor or whether there is any uptake in the extra hepatic region like the lung, uh, liver, uh, uh, sorry, and bone. And uh, one more most important thing is we can uh, know about the tumor biology. Uh, the PET is non fdg avid Most likely, it could be a, a less malignant when compared to a pet avid tumors. Oh. So I would uh, like to ask Dr. Sonal that have you faced any fallacies with regards to PET CT? Uh, yes, quite substantially. Uh, so I think that uh, I agree with the second part of what Arun has said. Uh, certainly an FTG avid tumor would be indicator of poor biology and there's uh, a large number of studies from the east which suggest that FTG avidity itself is linked with uh, a poor disease free and overall survival in uh, the LDNT setting. The fallacies that we face typically are in the identification of extra hepatic disease. Yes. So we feel that uh, FTG actually overcalls a lot of nodules where we ended up changing our tails especially nodules in the subcarinal region, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that FDG correlation of primary and secondary is very, very erratic. So you can have an FDG avid primary and non-FDG avid secondaries. You can have FDG avid secondaries. And uh, broadly yeah. speaking, you can have a large number of people who fall in the intermediate SUV range, yes. which actually are the biggest uh, confounders for us. So I think that uh, although there is value in identifying the primary tumor, but uh, the distant metastasis, especially when they're oligometastasis or low SUV should be taken with a pinch of salt. So uh, I would like so to may, may so I add something? What are his views about uh, doing a pet, routine PET CT when you are uh, dealing with a cirrhotic patient with HCC and probably you are considering him for some kind of curative therapy in terms of surgery? Yeah, so may I go forward? May I go ahead? Please, please. Yeah, so I was just uh, trying to take forward the point which uh, Dr. Sonal sir was making that yes, uh, PET CT comes with its own inherent uh, uh, fallacies and uh, detecting false positives. Uh, right now, we have a patient in our ward right now who is uh, a uh, hepatitis B carrier and diagnosed uh, with hepatocellular carcinoma. And uh, he has portal hypertension with ascites. Now, when the PET CT was done, uh, we also discovered some uh, omental stranding and some omental nodularity. Now, uh, we initially wanted this uh, uh, to be assessed because there was no other site of disease and patient is an otherwise fit patient. So um, when we uh, asked our intervention radiologist to go ahead and uh, do the omental sampling, he clear, clearly told us that it was too small to be sampled and uh, perhaps uh, the kind of patients he sees every now and then for with CLD, uh, omental stranding is pretty much uh, very common with patients of chronic liver disease itself. Now, this patient also had ascites. We got the ascites tap. It did not reveal any malignant cells. And it was a high sag ascites, typical uh, transudative ascites. So yes, uh, PET scan has the implication of, you know, uh, putting in a question mark in your mind whether really this patient has any extra hepatic disease or not. And therefore, it was always to be taken up with a pinch of salt. So uh, that was the point I was trying to come up with. And Dr. Suhail, you have made that point very nicely. 
that PET-CT definitely has a role, especially what Dr. Arun said, that AVDT leads to, uh, it is a poor prognostic marker. But the problem with PET-CT is that many a times it would give you false positive findings. Besides the mental uh, stranding that was mentioned by Dr. Sohail, many a times you would see lymph nodes in the abdomen lighting up on PET-CT. You biopsy them, you needle them, and ultimately they turn out to be inflammatory. You may find some small non-risk nodules in the lungs and again then you have to uh, go after those nodules getting them biopsy that ct guided or an endobronchially so it becomes a very tedious path and ultimately you end up nowhere so our enthusiasm for doing routine pet ct in these patients has waned these days although we still do them but we have become more selective so what patients in our practice would choose for doing a pet ct would be those who have poor prognostic markers, like outside criteria patients, large multiple nodules, high AFP or PIVCA patients, we would do PET-CT. But a routine patient presenting within the Milan or the UCSF with an AFP which is less than 100, we may omit PET-CT for the reasons that we just discussed. So PET-CT definitely has a role, but yes, there are certain fallacies which have to be kept in mind. So we should not go after every, each and every lymph node that in the abdomen that lights up on a PET CT or a small nodule or the lung or the mental stranding that was mentioned by Israel. And ultimately, they all turn out to be negative and the patient ends up being unnecessarily needed. Or, and many of these investigations, they are invasive investigations. And mind you, we have any complications. We have seen many of these as a result of these investigations. So we have become um, more easy with regards to investigating every, everything like the perfect CT. So the imaging results are as follows. It was a cirrhotic normal size liver, a 4.8 centimeter by 3.5 centimeter as well. Solitary lesion was seen in the segment eight and it showed the classical uh, it, you know, characteristics of NHCC. It was derived spike with no protein thrombosis or ascites. Patient at moderate stenomegaly. We did a PET CT. Again, it had a mild FDG uptake in the range of FD max of 3.9. The tumor dimensions are mentioned. Luckily, there was no other lesion in the liver, and the, the PET in this particular case did not show any extra hepatic disease. So, summarizing this case, it's a middle. He's a middle-aged patient with the cirrhosis secondary to chronic hepatitis B. Good performance status. He falls in child's A category and he's uh, got a solitary HCC in segment 8 of the liver uh, with a serum AFP of 87. So what are the treatment options? Dr. Arun, starting with you, what are the treatment options available for this patient? Uh, uh, since the patient is a child A, uh, we have two options left. The first uh, first option which would, uh, I will consider is uh, uh, liver resection because uh, the patient is uh, had a good performance status, chalier status, uh, bilirubin is normal. And uh, I would also like to look at his uh, uh, upper G endoscopy, whether varices is present or not. Uh, and uh, I would also like, and his platelets are almost like uh, one lakh, so probably for hypertension unlikely, but I would like to do upper G endoscopy. Uh, uh, to decide about whether uh, we can go ahead with the liver resection or not. Okay, so Dr. Madhu Mehta, would you routinely do HVPG in these patients before sending them to the surgeon? So in a patient who requires a major resection, we would require definitely a endoscopy number one to look for clinically significant total hypertension and then see the residual. Uh, if there's, there are evidence of viruses, then we know the HVPG is going to be more than 10. In such cases, one would not bother to do an HVPG assessment. But in case there is a difference of opinion, then one should do an HVPG at least. Like in this particular case, we are talking about he's absolutely like he's a child's A patient. Platelet count is above 1 lakh. Bilrubin is normal. Albumin is nearly normal. There's no ascites. Though there is some evidence of a mild splenomegaly, but there are no significant collaterals on the imaging. No, his albumin is low. It is 3.2. Yeah. 3 .2. 2. yeah. And so, but, the platelets are low, they are 1 lakh. Yeah. So this patient could well be harboring portal hypertension. If yeah. there are no viruses on endoscopy, then well, one can be relatively safe as not CSPH. But yeah. So yeah, there are certain indicators that he has underlying portal hypertension, which has not manifested itself grossly in the form of ascites or any GI bleed episodes. 
and many of these patients do show grade one varices, which again have to be taken with a pinch of salt because they are uh, more subjective findings. So this patient uh, has some indicators to suggest portal hypertension. But I just wanted your comment for the sake of the audience that what in what particular cases you will do HVPG. So if I have to offer major resection to a cirrhotic, albeit a compensated cirrhotic, I would like to know what is the functional uh, capacity of the liver. So test, tests like endocinin green test can also give some indication about uh, quantitative liver function test. Before offering a major resection, I would do an HVPG. Sure, thank you. So Dr. Uh, Sonal, coming to you, because that's the next thing, what is your thought on ICG? So ICG is a very useful modality for functional assessment. Uh, you know, ICG retention obviously is associated with worse outcomes uh, in patients uh, for whom we are contemplating a major resection. Uh, I mean, this particular patient has a large tumor, uh, will require a major hepatectomy, has evidence of low albumin that is poor synthetic function as well as portal hypertension. So actually, in my view, if you actually if you had a suitable donor. Uh, then I would think that actually a liver transplant would be a preferable option as compared to a resection in this particular patient. But uh, the, uh, if you we were going forward with a resection, we should make sure that we have measured the HVPG as a, as a great, I agree with my colleague, uh, you know, make sure that the portal hypertension is within limits. The second is uh, if we have any dynamic measurements available like ICG, we should use them. And the FLR is at least more than 40%. Sure, but just to play the devil's advocate, Dr. Sohail, why not uh, ablation? We have very good results with ablative therapies. This is a four centimeter tumor, uh, though three centimeter is the cutoff, but there are newer studies where up to five centimeters, the results are as good as resection. So what are your thoughts about offering ablation to these patients? Uh, so so well, uh, it, it really depends on uh, with, what is the location of this uh, of this tumor, how close it is it's to the diaphragm. Segmented of the liver. Okay, so yeah, segmented. Sorry, I, I just forgot that. So um, my my first my first uh, attempt would be to you know uh, give him the best possible shot. He's a very fit patient, yeah. and uh, if this is the kind of patient we cannot pick up for transplant, then uh, who else? So yes, my first uh, uh, intention would be to. Uh, send him to a transplant colleague for a workup for a transplant because this is the best kind of patient who would perhaps be uh, benefiting the most from uh, that intervention. So I would rather be slightly skeptical uh, skeptical of offering him ablation because this patient would fit the bill the best for uh, going ahead with the transplant. Yeah, but as mentioned in Dr. Uh, Sonal's talk that there are many, many cons associated with transplant with regards to the logistics, availability of the donor, if you are planning for a DDLT, then it might be an endless waiting game. So there are many difficulties with actually going on with uh, going ahead with transplant. It's not that it's freely available. And then there is a definite mortality associated with uh, liver transplant. He's a very fit patient. So uh, do you think ablation has a role or any of our panelists would like mm -hmm. to speak? Dr. Madhumita, what is your thought about ablative therapy in this patient? Ablative therapy, this is 4.8 centimeters, I believe. Yes. So that's... It's a borderline uh, thing. One could, I mean, it's a young patient. Uh, yeah. if, if he wants to go ahead for ablation, one can follow up closely. AFP is also elevated. One can offer ablative therapy, but it's not going to be curative. This would probably a bridging, be a bridging therapy. Yes, that is the most important point. And uh, please reiterate that point for the benefit of our uh, young audience. So this is not, I mean, these kind of local regional therapies for anything larger than three centimeters of lesion is not going to be curative. One has to be very clear to the patient that this is only going to offer a partial uh, cure. And after a while, the residual tumor cells are likely to progress. This is a cirrhotic patient after all. And that's only in the target lesion. The fact that carcinogenesis has happened in one part of the liver does not prevent it from coming in some other site. Mm -hmm. So if the gene mutations and the molecular uh, alterations have accumulated, then in a young fit patient, if we should al always offer curative intent. So one, I would choose either resection with a backup of transplant or I would go for transplant directly. Thank you. So coming to the, this debate of resection versus transplantation and uh, how to choose. So what has been recommended and what most of us would follow is 
this uh, slide, I think I put up the criteria. So one would consider transplant if the patient is decompensated, that is more than child's A. His bilirubin is more than two. Platelet counts less than one lakh, suggestive of significant portal hypertension. Same is true for splenomegaly. So these are all the points which go against resection, presence of collaterals on the imaging, varices on uh, upper G endoscopy, HVPG we have talked about, ICG, uh, like this would be a major resection. So I, ICG retention at 15 minutes, more than 10% is a strict no. And of course, the tumor location is very important. That was pointed out by Dr. Sohail. So when you are seeing uh, such a patient and you have stuck with the dilemma of resection versus transplantation, I think all these points have to be considered. And if the patient has any one or more of these points going against resection, then you should not offer resection to these patients. You should err on the side of doing less in terms of resection and choosing transplant because post-resection liver failure is a very definite mortality and with very poor survival outcomes. Most of these patients don't make it and may need an emergency transplant to salvage them. And again, emergency transplant is not an easy thing to do and the outcomes are not good. So moving on. So this patient, as everybody pointed out, we performed a transplant because he had indicators of portal hypertension and, depend, and since the tumor was situated in segment eight, which is a difficult area to approach and needs a major resection, so uh, it would have at least required a segment eight or at least an uh, anterior sectoral hepatectomy, and which in view of the existing portal hypertension would have increased the risk of post uh, resection liver failure. We offered a liver transplant. And the follow up protocol that we follow is we would do monthly blood tests in the form of CBC, LFT, KFT and TAC level for the first three months and three monthly AFPs. And then gradually as the time passes, the frequency of the tests comes down We'll do imaging in the form of an MRI every six months for two years and annually for the next five years. So this is our follow protocol, but there are many variations to the protocols depending on the center. And uh, they are, no one can say that which one is better, but this is what we have been following. So coming to the next case, and uh, I recently operated upon this patient. So he was a 65 years old, otherwise healthy male, incidentally detected to have liver cirrhosis. Uh, and there was a SOL on, uh, uh, SOL on USG during evaluation for a right upper quadrant pain. He had normal CBC, LFT, KFT and INR. He fell in the child's A category. His serum AFP was more than 100,000 and PIVCA, we have been routinely doing PIVCA for the last two years now because uh, Dr. Uh, Sonal had pointed out that only 40% of the patients may not have elevated AFP. Therefore, adding PIVCA to it increases the sensitivity of picking up the bad biology tumors. So his PIVCA and both serum AFP and PIVCA were markedly elevated. We performed an MRI which showed cirrhotic changes in the liver. And there were three tumors in the liver. One was a three, roughly three centimeters SOL uh, in segment, straddling segment six and seven. Another satellite module, 1.2 two centimeter and there was a segment six nodule which was 1.5 centimeter all located in the right lobe of the liver. There was moderate splenomegaly with prominent collaterals at the splenic hilum. There was no associated portal vein thrombosis or cystitis, and we did a PET scan because of the very high AFP and PIVCA values but fortunately it didn't show any extra hepatic disease. Upper GI endoscopy revealed grade two varices. So uh, Dr. Sonal, what would be your approach for this particular patient? Um, so this uh, gentleman clearly has a, a bad biology disease by our definition. Yes. You know, although uh, morphologically, uh, the disease seems to be sort of well controlled, but the AFP is very, very high. So uh, in this situation, we have to assume... It was 1 lakh 12,000 to be precise. 12, so uh, I think that... Uh, I would probably do a PET scan first in this patient. He did it. Okay, did what, it. what did you find? Yeah, but there was no evidence of uh, any extra hepatic disease, mild FDG avidity. Okay, so uh, this would be a patient who uh, I would first consider to be considered for bridging or downstaging therapy. Primarily because as we had discussed before, uh, uh, the, uh, the objective of downstaging is to get the AFP down to a level or the biology down to a more predictable level. So that we can act, uh, we can accurately prognosticate what the long-term survival is likely to be. 
at an alpha fetoprotein that is that high, we have to assume that either there is disease that we are missing, either intrahepatic or extrahepatically. So there are two things that we would like need to achieve. We would look at, we would need to sort of perhaps treat the tumor locally regionally, as well as give it some time to declare itself in terms of biology before we offer transplantation. Great. So Dr. Sohail and Dr. Madhumita, your opinion with this regard, what would be your approach? Dr. Sohail first, followed by Dr. Madhumita. So I would agree. I think uh, this is a bad tumor biology as evidenced by a very high level of uh, the alpha fetoprotein. And uh, although there are only three uh, lesions and uh, none of them are uh, higher than five centimeters, but I would wait for uh, the disease, uh, the, the tumor biology to uh, eventually uh, delineate the future course of action and perhaps go for a bridging therapy before he's taken up for a curative intent transplant. Madhumita? Sir, I have a question. Does the primary uh, lesion on the PET CT, is it showing FDG avidity? Yes, I said it was mildly avid, but SU max was less than five. So that is an issue because if we are using the PET CT as a screening tool for extrahepatic disease, we need to have the tumor itself be highly FDG avid. Uh, AFP more than one lakh suggests that there is likely to be either microvascular invasion or there might be extrahepatic disease, and maybe this kind of tumor is not very FDG avid. So, you know, using that as a yardstick may be erroneous in this case. So I think uh, the question of bridging and waiting for the patient to uh, show what is the true, we can't change the tumor biology. It is going to progress with time. And something with this high biomarkers on both PIFCA and AFP is going to progress. So if he, you? I mean, this is a case where one has to weigh the likelihood of progression. We can offer uh, bridging therapy as was suggested and see how it plays out after three months. And if uh, levels go down, one can then offer a curative transplant. Or if one transplants first, one has to realize that this is a candidate which is going to recur after transplantation or has a high likelihood to do so. So I think we do have a consensus <clears throat> that uh, some form of downstaging, I would say, because of the very uh, raised PIPCA and DFP value is recommended by the panelists. And mind you, Dr. Madhumita, when uh, you do a transplant and it recurs within a year, you, facing the family is a big challenge because the family has very high hopes. The patient and the family have very high hopes from transplant. After all, it's a very major undertaking if you look at it from the family standpoint because a donor, a young donor is coming forward for donation and they expect cure. So when you have such high value, straight away going transplant may not be advisable. And... Uh, uh, Actually, some people have suggested that biology is the king. That's true. That these patients should not be offered transplant at all because invariably they recur within the first one or two years. So, Dr. Arun, if we go for uh, some form of uh, downstaging, uh, what would be the modality of choice in your opinion? Uh, so, I agree with all my panelists. Uh, so, the tumor is like uh, uh, very bad, uh, had a very bad biology. So uh, the main plan would be like uh, going ahead with the downstaging procedure and follow up uh, with AFP and uh, uh, PIVCA two levels after three months. And the most common procedures which we usually do is uh, uh, transartial chemo embolization. Uh, transartial chemo embolization of the uh, lesions, particularly the three centimeter lesion. And sir, I would like to ask whether there is any evidence of uh, 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 second order branch PVTT there in the spec city. Oh, there, as I mentioned, there was no evidence of PV, uh, PVT. Yeah, on no MRI. Evidence. MRI is quite sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. I'd okay. okay. So uh, I would like to go ahead with uh, transartial chemo embolization and uh, I would follow up uh, with AFP and PVTT. So I think uh, there is a consensus and uh, we did what you just said. So we did a downstaging with TACE and uh, luckily all the tumors were on the right side. Actually, the left side was not very big. And most of the uh, liver mass was on the right side only. And we did a taste. There was, and this patient presented to us first time in March, 27th March, I still remember the date when we did the taste. And then we kept on observing him, kept on following him with uh, every uh, two weeks we did the AFP values. He was from Sikkim, so Pivka was not available there. He kept on sending me his AFP values. And from 1,12,000, they came to around <coughs> 700. So we called him over. And then we did a repeat uh, MRI and a PET also, it's been missed here. So that did not show 
any progression of the disease and as i just mentioned afp values had fallen dramatically from more than 1 lakh to less than 1000 therefore uh, the patient was subjected to an ldlt from his son so this is the picture uh, the mri pictures the pre and post you can see the difference uh, these are the both the pictures pre and post taste so uh, the tumor after taste is hardly lighting up except for this small nodule in this part of the one part of the tumor and the histology that came out finally on explant was that was a 96% tumor necrosis but the 4% that was there was a grade 3 tumor so we keeping our fingers crossed i had consulted the family regarding the chance of recurrence to the tune of about 20% so this is how like uh, i would this case i chose specifically to highlight the importance of the tumor markers the afp and pevka and these has been repeatedly shown in literature that despite the tumor within milan or within ucsf you see very frequent recurrences if you have high afp values so these patients either they are not offered transplant but if you have to offer transplant it's better to downstage wait give the biology to time for the biology to manifest itself like 3 4 months that we gave uh, to this patient and then if you are satisfied with the response to the downstaging therapy and there is no evidence of progression at least there should be stable disease on the post uh, downstaging imaging modality then only you have, uh, progress to transplant you have to be very cautious in transplanting these patients dr shalin may make a comment on yes, this uh, pivka actually i think yeah. that uh, uh, i just wanted to say something about pivka because pivka are basically proteins that are induced by vitamin k or vitamin k uh, dependent clotting factors or antagonists yeah so in situations which have got high inr or patients on anticoagulation will actually have high pepka high value. pepka values so yeah. especially when you have patients with but kiari uh, who have multiple nodules who are perhaps on warfarin please reverse the warfarin before you check the pepka okay that that's a that's sort of a very important operational point thank you but do you agree with the what the treatment plan that we followed in this patient or any of the panelist has some comments to make about it uh, no I, i think that it was very good uh, that you you got an excellent response and you followed through with it which is uh, given him the best survival uh, possibility actually so i think that's that's really good yeah so this is the message i would like to give to our uh, young surgeons and physicians that please be very despite the tumor being within criteria don't be very uh, over enthusiastic about subjecting these trans patients to an early transplant because we have burnt our fingers in the past and uh, i think everybody has had bad experiences when patients despite being within criteria recurred just because we tried to ignore the importance of the tumor markers so moving to the uh, third and the last case because i think we are running out of time i'll quickly go through this case Uh, this was a 39 years old gentleman known case of chronic hepatitis c uh, this is a patient we treated about a year back good performance status he had achieved svr after 12 week course of uh, uh, antiviral agent ctpa again and then he had an incidentally detected lesion in the right lobe of liver on ultrasound mri confirmed the solitary right lobe as well 4.1 cm to be an hcc but this time he had a thrombus in the right branch of the portal vein along with it there was evidence of portal hypertension in terms of borderline splenomegaly with dilated coronary vein upper gi endoscopy showed grade 1 esophageal varices his afp was less than 1000 but still elevated and pet ct showed an fdg a with liver lesions and a portal vein thrombus no extra hepatic disease so this is the picture of this particular patient Uh, we have the tumor, and then we have the thrombus in the right branch of the portal vein. So, what is the nature of these thrombus, Doctor Arun? How would you determine on the basis of imaging that whether this is a tumor thrombus or a bland thrombus? Because bland thrombi are very common in patients with long-standing cirrhosis. Uh, tumor thrombus are uh, generally expand cell. Uh, the diameter of the portal vein gets increased because of the expansion. and the other most important thing will be the contrast enhancement uh, in the arterial phase uh, uh, within the portal vein i mean within the tumor thrombus these two are the most common things which you look at whether to find out whether is it, whether it is a tumor thrombus or a bland thrombus so dr arun very rightly said and i have summarized the points that you made in this slide 
so characteristics of a tumor thrombus are enhancement in the arterial phase itself that is venous enhancement of the thrombus in the arterial phase widening of or distension of the vein increase in uh, venous diameter and elevated serum afp is a very strong indicator that this thrombus is not a bland thrombus it's a tumor thrombus and presence of thrombus in the close vicinity of the tumor so these four points are the criteria on the basis of which we, you can differentiate between a tumor thrombus vis-a-vis -vis a bland thrombus so uh, dr sohel what are the available options treatment options the same question again for this particular patient dr sohel are you still there hello am i audible dr shefali can you hear me dr sohel yeah yeah dr sohel uh, you should unmute actually i think you are on mute that is why so if by any reason dr sohel is unable to take this question i'll pass on the question to dr madhumita hello uh sir you are audible i mean at least i can uh, hear you all. so dr sonal please I answer i hope you are audible to adjust yeah am i am i audible yeah yeah you are very well audible okay i think uh, okay sohel is uh, not able to unmute himself for some reason yeah both sohel and madhumita are not able to get my question i believe i'm sorry uh, was it put to me yeah yeah dr madhumita okay. So if, the, if it's a bland thrombus and there's no issue at all i mean that's very that's there's only a branch uh, total vein no, but thrombus. i think there are certain indicators to suggest that this is not a bland thrombus he yes, has high it's a tumor thrombus and it is showing arterial enhancement and wash out just the way the hcc word if it is uh, yeah it is unlikely yeah if it's a, a tumoral thrombus then i would uh, offer a tear in such a patient of y90 tear because that would give a good uh, response even if there is a portal vein thrombus even deptase can be used but uh, tear has got better uh, outcomes and less chance of post uh, local regional therapy decompensation okay so how would deptase uh, take care of the tumor thrombus it could take care of the main tumor but i think there is uh, the tumor thrombus is although close but some distance away so uh, I agree with tear, but how would deb taste deal with the tumor part of? Uh, so normally, in these kind of patients, we are combining tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or we would give immunotherapy. So, a combination therapy would show better options. And in PVT at our center, we are using uh, SBRT as well. So that can focus specifically the tumor thrombus and has got excellent results. So that is what we did. A tear is a very good option, but it's very expensive. Actually, it costs around fourteen to fifteen lakhs in our center. So many patients, because of the financial reasons, are unable to go for a tear. So what we did was the second best option. I would say it's equally good. There are no studies to prove the superiority of one over the other. We did a super selective test for the main tumor. We offered SBRT for the main tumor thrombus. Waited for uh, the tumor biology to show up. Repeated a contrast MRI and a PET scan after twelve weeks. so uh, luckily for this patient the tumor thrombus became had become bland and there was no evidence of extra hepatic disease on pet and the afp had significantly come down though not less than 100 but it was still reasonably low 312 and therefore we subjected this patient to a liver transplant after 3 months of the down staging with the hope that although we are not expecting that he would behave the same as a patient within that criteria but he had shown very good response to our down staging protocol so we did a liver transplant in this patient and it's been almost one year i would say 11 months since we did the transplant he continues to remain tumor free but we are keeping our fingers crossed because it was an aggressive disease to begin with so with this uh, i would uh, end the cases i would be happy to have take questions for our panelists from the audience or for me if we can answer any questions from the audience so i have a small uh, comment to make sir if i may just say so yeah please please i mean we have been extensively transplanting patients with hcc but now we are finding a lot of these cases in fact it's a whole new disease process in itself post transplant early recurrence of hcc now i completely agree stage for stage the best survival outcomes are available with 
surgical, I mean, with transplant, no doubt. But this whole new issue of managing patient with early transplant recurrence is a major problem. We are yeah. having two patients currently with us who are having a recurrence uh, within a year mm -hmm. of the transplant. So I have a slide yeah. for that also. And that is, uh, I think every center who is transplanting patients with HCC has seen cases and uh, we are no different. So there comes the role for adjuvant therapy or palliative uh, role of biologicals. And there are patients who have shown very good response with, at least with lenvatinib. So rafinib, we had disappointing results, but we have had reasonably good uh, results in terms of stable disease for up to two, two and a half years with lenvatinib. And we have offered combination of lenvatinib followed by nivolumab, but patients don't tend to tolerate nivolumab that well as lenvatinib. So our mainstay of therapy in these patients with recurrence are either ablation, which could be an RFA or microwave, uh, if it's a solitary or a localized recurrence, along with or solitary uh, use of kinase inhibitors, especially lenvatinib. Sir, I completely agree that TKIs would actually be the choice. But after transplant, there's a problem giving checkpoint inhibitors because they induce an immune flare and can trigger rejection. Yes. Or they can uh, trigger at least a flare of acute hepatitis. So we have burnt our fingers with post-transplant uh, recurrence and given um, nivolumab in that case. But certainly pre-transplant, it's an excellent uh, choice. Dr. Sohel, what has been your experience with regards to managing recurrences? Sir, probably we had some issue and has left. So this was my uh, next question to you and the panelists also. See, uh, if the recurrence occurs uh, maybe early or maybe at the later stages, and if you exhaust your TKI options, so in a post-transplant patient, how should we proceed? So like immunotherapy has certain kind of limitations. So, yeah. so what should we uh, do at that point of time? So yeah. I think before going for the uh, systemic agents, best results that we have seen is with local ablative therapy. Local ablative therapy, especially microbe, they are safe and very effective. And combining them with tyrosine kinase inhibitors or checkpoint inhibitors, although I would, as Dr. Madhumita said, that uh, checkpoint inhibitors have their own problems with regards to their interaction with the uh, immunosuppressants and higher incidence of rejection. But PKIs are very safe. And combining them with these local ablative therapies has given a new hope for these patients. Like two, three years we have seen, there is no large scale data for this uh, till now, but yes, they are being tried with good results. And we have even done taste in post-transplant setting without any risk of graft. There have been multiple references. But yes, they should always be combined with any of these agents, whichever you are comfortable or your patient is comfortable, we are comfortable with people. Uh, Dr. Shalin, okay. can one comment? Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, sir. I, I think that we have to be a little circumspect about recurrence in HCC. The commonest cause of death in a cirrhotic with HCC is liver failure. Uh, it's, uh, so, so basically, as we've discussed, we've actually treated two diseases, the HCC as well as the liver. Yeah. So if you have, in any other oncological setting, as Dr. Shefali uh, would know, I think overall survival is basically what matters rather than disease free survival. So remember that even if we are in the situation where we have a disease recurrence, we are dealing with the disease recurrence in the context of a fully functioning liver. So basically our uh, treatment options actually increase substantially. So even if we have a recurrence in a patient who has uh, these outcomes in the, uh, uh, or rather have these, we have a whole armamentarium of things that can be deployed in order to treat it, which we would not protect it. Yeah, that is what I just mentioned, that we have multiple uh, options available to us post-transplant. But yes, we should not be very gung-ho also about transplanting these patients. Everything has to be correct. Taken care of. I, I absolutely. But, but it's a very big undertaking. Yeah. And, uh, I think our thinking also has changed from DFS to OS. Yeah. And also understanding that, uh, you know, even a patient with recurrence, as Dr. Shali has very clearly said, can look to two or three year survival advantage, you know, uh, with, with the therapies that we have at this time. Right. right. I completely agree with you, sir. So because, I mean, with the recurrence uh, and having the limitations of not using a checkpoint inhibitors, which have actually revolutionized the treatment in a palliative setting. 
so so the limitations are certainly there so i completely agree with you to choose a pick i mean to pick and choose very wisely is the way to go forward because the patient and the family are looking towards the cure os is the goal rather than a dfs in such a modality of treatment so i think we should go ahead with the very selective criteria in those situations so uh, let me check the chat box sir if there are any uh, questions which are unanswered still um, yeah so there is a question sir dr taneja has asked so decompensated cirrhosis with small hcc bclc d will you transplant or not so uh, sir you can take this question yeah what is the question sorry i missed on that yeah so the question is uh, decompensated cirrhosis with small hcc bclc d will you transplant or not c bclc d means that the performance status is not very good for this patient obviously this uh, performance poor performance status is an absolute contraindication by the bclc staging but over the years it has been seen that in the ldlt settings and even in the ddlt settings bclc is a very restrictive kind of classification system you are excluding the benefit of curative modalities to most of these patients if you stick to bclc so i would like to evaluate this patient if he has any reasonable performance status and we are on the basis of our experience we can say that this patient can tolerate a transplant we should definitely go for transplant for the simple reason that he his risk of dying from hcc is much less compared to his risk of dying from the decompensated liver disease so even if he was not didn't have an hcc even then this patient merited a transplant but obviously we have to see his performance status and when we talk about uh, uh, this performance status thing this is again a very sub become a very subjective thing what we max are seeing patients most of these patients are coming at the very end of their uh, liver failure cycle most of them these patients are in renal failure deeply jaundiced with multiple episodes of encephalopathy so if and non ambulatory so we are offering transplants to these patients and have had very good results so i would say that uh, that d category has to be again sub categorized and only the sickest of the sickest should be uh, refrained from uh, offering a transplant otherwise transplant is a very good option for these patients right sir so there is one more question so uh, dr asthana sir you can take it technically apart most of the patients in northeast india with hcc happens to be poor for which ldlt is out of option for them so what do you suggest we do about them so this is question by dr aribam i mean i think it goes back to the first point about uh, access availability and local expertise you know because it's very difficult to come up with a single answer for everything and even as dr shalin has uh, you would have seen I mean, the differences between our center which has got some ddlt ldlt versus delhi which is almost completely ldlt is are, are also there actually so regarding the re question of finance it is sadly a universal problem it's not just a northeastern problem uh, we at our center have a fairly good uh, experience with uh, raising funding for appropriate patients with csr funding as well as with crowd funding and that's something that uh, uh, we can do at our level to try to raise it uh, there are larger efforts afoot through the national health authority to create some sort of uh, you know package for liver transplantation which would then be covered by ayushman bharat so i think that this is a slightly separate question regarding uh, uh, you know lack of access due to a lack of funding again this is uh, there are local efforts that can be done like our own which has csr and there can be national efforts uh, which will probably be in place in the next 3 or 4 years but clearly all these patients uh, dr uh, sharma who should be selected based on uh, their potential for compliance you know because uh, certainly we have found that patients who are too poor to even afford ongoing therapy or non compliant would perhaps not be good candidates uh, for for selection for this so i think that while patients can be selected and patients can be supported even with existing mechanisms uh, the selection criteria for these should prioritize compliance because otherwise the entire outcome of the exercise is not very useful right sir so uh, next question dr madhumita if you can take over though i think it has been uh, discussed earlier also so what is the role of pipkin hcc especially when afp is normal around 30% of uh, patients are actually not uh, having raised afp 
in such cases the use of pfca would actually give some prognostic indication and should be used as a surrogate tumor markers actually rather than uh, i mean we have been reading about dcp and uh, afp lens kilo l3 and lens kilo nars type uh, but i think the future would actually hold towards personalized medicine in hcc so we should be looking at a lot more about liquid biopsy and molecular diagnostics which would actually help us guide which kind of uh, you know tyrosine kinase inhibitor therapy or whether lenvatinib would work better for uh, for example uh, the ramesirumab trial had afp more than 400 versus less than 400 oh, yeah. so these things would come in the future so uh, i would suggest that i mean if afp is not elevated then one can try the pfca but is not available in routine practice and we are not doing it uh, unnecessarily right right so i think uh, all of the questions have been answered so i thank you all very much for a very elaborate and very very comprehensive session at the outset again and answering all of our questions patiently thank you so much and uh, the next session will be focusing on the systemic treatments in hcc all the bridge overs again the immunotherapies the vegf inhibitors egfr inhibitors everything so thank you so much for joining thank you sir thank you thank you so much dr kripal thank you for the invitation thank, thank you. you right sir thank you